yeah, also, y'all pray for Eric and Nambi. He should be he should be back in Pittsburgh by now. He's flying back, and Rachel and the kids went up to pick him up today. Um, Eric's gotten a taste of. Uh, they were down in when they went to Tennessee. He got got a one of the uh, the black Hebrew Israelites come up and started arguing with them. And um, I appreciate those guys, man. That's a uh, that's a true that's a true soldier of Christ to go out in a place like like Mardi Gras and stand out there and proclaim the gospel of Christ. People's like, uh, well, what effect does it have? And that's spoken like somebody that ain't never going to do anything for the Lord anyway. I don't worry about it. Uh, one of the effects of the gospel is to be foolishness to them that perish. Paul said he, he said he said that he didn't preach the gospel with enticing words. Lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us that are saved it is the power of God. You just preach a cross. Don't, ever, don't listen to me. You get the word of God out in the air, and it's going to be effect. It's going to have an effect. You see, we weren't just called to be the savior of life unto life. We were called to be the savior of death unto death also. So in this world, you got them that perish and them that are saved. And our ministry in the one, we smell of death unto God and remind him of the death of his son. In the other, we smell of life unto God and remind him of the life of his son. Either way, we smell of the sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. Amen. First Thessalonians, guys, we talked about this Sunday. Y'all going to get a bit of a rehasher here. And uh, I'm going to try to try to get deeper into this thing than I did Sunday. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The reason I'm doing this, guys, and y'all 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 don't take me wrong. This is a lot of some of the stuff I get up here and teach. I don't believe our I don't believe our church has a problem with it. I believe our I believe we got a great church here, guys. There's not a single individual in this church that I look at and say Oh, I, 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 but they need to change. They need to do something. They blah 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 blah. We got a great church here. We really do. I love the people here. But of what I what I've noticed what I've noticed a, I've noticed a trend in modern Christianity, and that is the Bible, biblical morality, and biblical godliness is just on a steady de degradation and decline. And, and, I mean, we, we need to, Paul talks over in Timothy about, you, you know, the, the way men use the Bible today, like they'll take 1 Corinthians 14, 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet or be spiritual, let him acknowledge the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. And here's how they handle a verse like that. If you believe Paul's your special apostle for this dispensation, you're spiritual. Has, there's nothing dispensational in the text. The spiritual, if a man thinks himself to be spiritual, then he has to acknowledge everything Paul had just written as the commandments of the Lord. Everything from spiritual gifts to charity to the edification of the body of Christ. They'll take, God will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And here's how they read the verse. God will have all men to be saved and to learn right division. Whereas Paul tells you in Titus that he was an apostle according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness and hope of eternal life which God that cannot. The truth that we are teaching and acknowledging is after something in hope of something. You all understand that? The truth we acknowledge is after godliness. God's truth is after godliness. None of us, listen man, we all got sin. We all do. We all got these bodies of flesh. But the truth God is teaching us and wanting us to acknowledge is after godliness in hope of eternal life. Paul tells us that godliness carries with it a promise. Right? And so we are to be exercising ourselves. Right? Now, 
We looked at this Sunday, but if you notice here in the text, Paul says that ye have received something and ye know something. He says, as ye received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more, for ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Now let, let, me, let, let me say this. If you are a true Pauline dispensationalist, like many claim to be, and if you truly follow Paul, and he's your apostle, like they all claim, right? Romans through Philemon is your doctrine, right? These are talking points. They, all those are true. I'm a Pauline dispensationalist. Paul is the apostle to us Gentiles. Romans through Philemon is our doctrine for this dispensation, right? But if you are a true Pauline dispensationalist and you're following Paul and you're truly reading and studying the Pauline doctrine in Romans through Philemon, notice what you are receiving. You are receiving how you are to walk and to please God. Amen? That's what you're receiving through that instruction, through that doctrine. How you are to walk and to please God. You see, I've watched over the years, man, I've watched people sit and devour one another over whether we should call ourselves Christian or not. I've watched that. I've watched debates on that. Peter used the word, therefore we can't. I've literally watched people eat each other's face off. If you was actually learning how you were to walk and to please God, you'd understand that's nonsense. To bite and devour one another over stuff like that. Where were they first called Christian? Antioch. The whole family in heaven and earth bears one name. And it's named of God the Father in Christ. But I've watched them set and, and set and devour one another over whether we should call ourselves Christian, have debates for days on who wrote the book of Hebrews. Right? Tell, I've, watched, I've watched this stuff. I've watched men set and tell men who's been saved and preaching for 40 years, they're not saved because they don't believe lost men's sins are forgiven. Telling a man he's not saved because he don't believe a lost man's sins are forgiven. I've watched them do it. They sit and the debate and fight and devour one another over this stuff. Obsess over what happened to the little flock. Amen? Amen? Lord over people, Lord over people, Paul's my apostle, then accused us of setting up an elite status. Those people got the most elitist mentality I've ever seen. Those people will not condescend them. These people are so high and mighty, they can't even find a place to fellowship with other Christians most of the time. Amen? And the reality is they set Lord over people who, because I know Paul's my apostle and Romans through Philemon is mine, while disobeying the vast majority of the instruction found in it. Lowliness of mind, right? Condescending to men of low estate, mind not high things, be not puffed up for one against another. Learning us not to think of men above that which is written, be followers of me. They claim to be these great students of the Word of God, and yet when you bring up their personal walk, they lose their ever-loving minds. Amen? A Christian life, guys. Gary, how long have you been saved, brother? 47 years. Would you say that your Christian life has been marked by Gradual growth and increase. You're not worse than you were, are you? No. <laughs> 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 
And it's, it's getting, it's, what we have to understand is each generation in America, each generation in America is being born into worse and worse conditions. And, and the only hope that every generation has is the Word of God. I've, I've been amazed. Guys, I've got a, I still got a lot, a long way to go in this thing, but I'm amazed at what God has done in my heart. I truly am. And I'm going to tell you something, a Christian life that is not marked by increase in the knowledge of God, maturing the believer spiritually unto a walk in obedience to the commandments of our Lord Jesus Christ for the pleasure of God the Father is not in the very least Pauline at all. Amen? Let me lay it out again. You can have all your positions, all your points, all your timelines, a Christian life that is not marked by an increase in God's knowledge, learning, learning how we are to walk and to please God through the commandments that's given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ is not Pauline in the least. Amen. 1 Corinthians 4, 15 through 17. See, a lot of people call themselves Pauline, dispensationalists and all this. Notice what Paul says here. Though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, did you know you could have 10,000 instructors in Christ and not follow Paul? Look what he says, wherefore I beseech you be ye followers of who? I, a lot of people, when they call themselves Pauline dispensationalists and we follow Paul, really they're following another man's idea of what that means. And you can hear it in the speech. Amen? There's all these, there's all these positions... And all these, all these little standings that people have that are not biblical, they're sayings that come out of camps and movements. Amen? When God sees you, He sees Christ. Let me tell you what Paul said on the issue. You ready? He says, seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of who? God. God's watching. He's watching. He's watching if you're being deceitful and handling the word of God, walking in craftiness. He knows who's manifesting the truth and commending themselves to every man's conscience. But you just get these little statements, it don't, it don't matter what I do, God sees Christ. Amen? And it's, it's caused, I've, I've battled this stuff too, man. America's morals have went to the gutter because of stuff like that. God has had to get in there and completely renew my mind and teach me how to think. Because we were enemies to God right here. The only thing that's going to bring your mind back into reconciliation with God is the acknowledging of the truth. And so you got 10,000 instructors, get that. But Paul says, be ye followers of me. You know, spiritual men can discern the words of man's wisdom and the words of the Holy Ghost. I know where you're getting your rebuttals. It's like David Osteen said when he was here. He said, we can tell a parrot when we see one. We know a parrot when we hear one. We know the words of men and the words of God. You ain't going to kid a spiritual man. I know where your rebuttals are coming from, your defenses, your arguments. I know exactly where they're coming from. And Paul, notice this, 
Notice what a true Pauline man does. You ready? You got all these instructors. I want you to follow me. For this cause have I sent unto you who? Who was he? Beloved what? Faithful in who? What was his purpose? To bring them in remembrance of what? My ways which be in who? As I teach everywhere and in every church. A true Pauline minister is not just out here shooting off the mouth about some positional points. He's trying, a true Pauline minister is bringing the church in remembrance of these ways of Paul which be in Christ. Now if you want to read the text, if you want to read the context and find out what his ways were, I'll tell you what they were. Y'all want to hear some of them? Being reviled, we what? Bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. I speak not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you, though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. I've sent Timothy unto you to bring you in remembrance of my ways which be in Christ. Amen. You want to see, you see what he calls himself here? You have not many what? What's he called Timothy? He had just got done calling them his beloved sons. Right here he says, I'm the only father you got. Timothy is my beloved son who's going to bring you in remembrance of my ways. Do you want to see how Paul instructed his children? As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Paul instructed his children how to walk worthy of God. And I think this is failing in modern Christianity. People, people act like there's, people act like there's, there's, they act like there's two, two camps. Guys, grace is ineffectual if you don't know how to live under it. Just like men were under the law, we're under grace. Paul wrote Galatians, and he, he talks about them who, who were removed from them that called them into the grace of Christ. He talks about them, he, he says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. He talks about falling from grace in Galatians 5. Did you know a Christian can fall from grace? How about the Corinthians? Did you know you can receive the grace of God in vain? What good is it going around? What good does it do to go around and talk about being under grace if you don't know how to live under it? We live under grace through the faith of God's Son. I'm not going to frustrate that grace. I don't want to receive it in vain. But that's just, that's just man. They've learned all this stuff from men. You don't have to be a, a fundamental legalist that nobody can stand to be around without perverting the grace of God. Great, the grace of God is going to teach you righteousness and true holiness, which is what I want. I sat, I've sat and prayed about this stuff since I was 20. Man, I hate sin in me. I can't stand it. Like David, man, God, I was shaping in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. I am what I am. I was by nature a child of wrath. I'm just trying. I want God to renew me into the image of His Son. That's all I want. We're in that process, man. But we've got to get this stuff straight. Right? A man. So, if you're receiving... What we're talking about here, if you're receiving the ministry of Paul, you're receiving how you are to walk and to please God. Now, it doesn't mean, doesn't mean that you wake up and you put it into perfect practice all the time. 
That's why Paul says that you would abound more and more. Guys, there's many days I wake up and I just throw my hands up. I'm facing things and battling things and I just throw my hands up and say, I don't know what to do today. I really do. But I'm, I'm going to tell you something, man, and I've, I know Gary's probably learned this the older he gets. The older I get, the more I understand this. While we're all in our, in, while we're all in our imperfection, I'm going to tell you right now, Charity and love is going to keep you from doing a lot of stupid stuff. The greatest protector we have is love. It covers a multitude of sins. Love worketh no ill towards his neighbor. It's better just to love one another and, and don't worry about the details that we ain't got worked out yet. I've learned that, man. Love, patience, these things will keep you safe and from doing stupid stuff. And so not only are we receiving how we are to walk, but notice a man that's in obedience of faith to the Pauline apostleship possesses knowledge of what? Commandments given to us by who? Boy, Moses did that to Israel, didn't he? It's almost like Jesus is the Moses of the body of Christ, doesn't it? Was Moses a mediator? How many mediators are there between God and man? The man who? Why did God give us that mediator? In compliance to his will concerning all men being saved and coming to the knowledge of the truth. This church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, has received from Paul commandments that were given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you're walking after Paul, if you're following after this doctrine and you're obeying it in faith, you're receiving it the way you're supposed to receive it, you are being given knowledge of the commandments of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I can, I can start quoting them to you right off the top of my head without batting an eye. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Let love be without dissimulation. Brethren, avenge not yourselves. As much as in you is, live peaceably with all men. Let every soul be subject unto the powers that be. Let lo or, 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 or owe no man anything but to love one another. Knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than, we, than when we believe. Let us walk honestly as in the day. Put on the armor of light. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh. Let every man, he said, let every man please his neighbor for his good to edification, for even Christ please not himself. I would have you wise to that which is good and simple concerning evil. Shall we keep going? You know how many comments, you know how many commandments you got in those epistles given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ? Cast out that wicked person from among you. Let us, let us keep the feast, not with the, with the unleavened bread. I mean, you, I mean guys, this, this is what's in our Bible. Bear ye one another's burdens, so fulfill ye the law of Christ. Amen? Put off concerning the former conversation. Be ye filled with the Spirit, redeeming the time. We are not without instruction. We are not without commandments in the body of Christ. Amen? Mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. These are all things that we read about in Paul, Paul's epistles. We are receiving how we are to walk by him giving us knowledge of what the commandments of our Lord Jesus Christ is. And when we walk in these commandments that were given to us by the Lord Jesus, our walk is pleasing unto God. And it it's really comes down, core and taught on it Sunday, man, what God is looking for is selfless, the selfless love of His Son operating in each and every one of us. I think, I think all of us are selfish to an extent, aren't we? And I've, I've, learned, I've learned the more that I quit focusing on myself, the freer, the more liberty I feel I have. Amen? 
Now notice what he says here. This is the will of God. For this is the will of God, even your what? So what is God's will? Your what? Your sanctification is the will of God. Paul defines it here as abstaining from something. That every one of you should know how to what? Possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in the lust of concupiscence. Even as the Gentiles which know not God. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any manner. For the Lord is the avenger of all such. As we have, for, as we have testified and forewarned you. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness. But unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth. Despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given to us his Holy Spirit. You know what's being penned here by the apostle? Do you know who the apostle is? He has the Holy Spirit of God. And he says when you despise it, you don't despise men, you despise God. I just want to be clean, man. Dr. Ruckman said, Dr. Ruckman said the reason he went to Bob Jones University, <laughs> he said it was the first place he'd ever been in his life that was clean. He said, the, he, and he, said, he, said he got there, found out they were Bible correctors and everything else. But you're talking about a man that was, if you read Ruckman's book on the, the full cup, man, you realize Ruckman had a pretty rough life. I've, I've looked at things and saw things and put things in my body and did things, man, that corrupted me to the core. And the Word of God has been slowly but surely washing me, renewing me over my life. Man, I just want to be clean. What was it Peter said? Wash me, Lord, and I shall be clean. David said it. Wash me. Peter's the one that said, don't just, don't just get my feet, Lord. Get my hands and my head also, you know. <laughs> I was talking to Brother Bill the other day, man. We was talking about some of this stuff. I was talking about the darkness of this world. And I said, Bill, I feel it, man. Two or three days go by and I don't read my Bible. My mind starts thinking different. I start, it just, and you know, I, I go to the Word of God and it's like taking a bath. Just going and saying, Lord, wash me in your Word. You know, Christ gave himself for the church that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water by the Word. Christ shed his blood so that he could take this book and wash you and make you clean. Think about that. You see, man, it's, it's, a lot of people don't, I mean, here's, here's what they focus on. Here's what they focus on. Justification, glorification. Whom God, whom God foreknew, he predestinated. Whom he predestinated, them he called. Whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, he glorified. What about in between there? Do you know your sanctification? You've, you've been sanctified in Christ. But what does that mean? It means set apart. Are you fulfilling the purpose for which we were set apart? I'm going to tell you something. Sanctification is optional. You abstaining from fornication, knowing how to possess your vessel in sanctification and honor, that's optional right there, guys. Amen? Amen. Paul, listen, look over here in 2 Corinthians 6. Wherefore, come out from among them. I believe the them there can be, Bible, can be Christians. What agreement, what, what agreement 
Has a man who believes this book is the infallible word of God with an infidel? What fellowship has light with darkness? What agreement hath the temple of God with the temple of idols? Paul says, Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith who? Not Paul Lucas. Touch not the unclean thing. And what did God tell you he would do? And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. We ain't, we ain't dealing with anybody's justification here. We're dealing with a justified believer's the context of 2 Corinthians 6 is the Corinthians not receiving God's grace in vain. Not receiving it to no benefit, to no effect. And he says, he says, our mouth is open, our heart is enlarged. The problem was in the Corinthian, not God or his word. They're, they're, he's talking about not receiving God's grace in vain and keeping a closed heart to God's word. Not separating ourselves so that we can be instructed as what? What did God say he would do for you if you come out, made yourself separate? What did he say he would do for you? And you'll be what? Sounds like a deal to me. How are you going to respond? It's optional. This right here is optional. God ain't going to force any of you to come out from among them and be separate. But he says, if you do, I'll receive you. So here's the, here's the, here's the proper response. Having therefore these promises. Dearly beloved, let us cleanse. Let us. You see the exhortation? Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Paul, that guys, he, we're not talking about us just waking up one day and saying, well, I'm not going to be filthy today. He's talking about, here's basically what Paul's saying. Turn the TV off for a little bit. Turn the secular music off for a little bit. Come out of that world and quit touching that unclean thing. And separate yourself for God. And God will be your father and you'll be his sons and daughters. He'll instruct you. And, and when we do that, when we, when we separate ourselves from the, from the secular world and put ourselves in the book... We are cleansing ourselves of all filthiness of the flesh and spirit so that we might perfect holiness in the fear of who? God. Amen. That's all Paul's saying. He's not talking about you waking up and just being holy tomorrow. He's not talking about this self-righteous nonsense. He's saying, set yourself apart so that God can teach you and instruct you and cleanse you and perfect you. You know what perfecting holiness is? It means perfecting the purpose for which you are set apart for God. Amen? Now, I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to go back. Well, let me read you this verse. And then, guys, we were in Corinthians. I, I want to I get back into this because I think it's important, man. I really do. Notice, though, I believe this sanctification aspect of our Christian life, right? Guys, listen. Do you know there's a life that now is? And there's one to come? Godliness has a purpose right now. Now it's not to set in the heavenly places upon thrones and dominions. That's coming. That glory is coming. 
Godliness right now is the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Amen? Now this is where you start leaving the modern Christian. Guys, I can't think of anything that I want to know more than the fellowship of God's son's sufferings. Could you, you, say, you say, why would you say that, preacher? Because that is a love that no man is capable of comprehending in his natural ability. The more you, under, the more you fellowship in his sufferings, the more you're comprehending the height, breadth, depth, and love, or the height, breadth, depth, and length, and knowing the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. We just get to participate a little, a little taste and a little, a little fellowship of those sufferings and to be able to know. That's why Paul said we glory in tribulation because we know something. Tribulation works patience. Patience experience and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. It's a... Uh, but I want you to understand, guys, that this sanctification, it's optional. And a lot of the times it's going to, it's going to depend on how you receive the Word of God. Notice who they, who they received it from. When you received the Word of God, which ye heard of what? They heard it. They heard it. The Corinthians heard it. Paul taught the same thing in Corinth that he taught in Thessalonia. Amen? The Thessalonians were an example. The Corinthians had to have Timothy come to them and bring them in remembrance of Paul's ways. Amen? They both heard the same thing. He said, as I teach everywhere in every church, when you receive the word of God which ye heard of us, you received it not as the word of men. But as it is in truth, the word of God. As long as you just keep thinking this stuff is just camps and positions and denominations. Reliable translations. Speaking in the words of man's wisdom. You've got to receive these things as the word of God. God's will for us. Let me, let, me, let, me tell you, let me tell you what the Pauline epistles are there for. They're there so that you can receive how you are to walk and to please God. They are there so that you can know the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ as His church. They're there because God's will is our sanctification. That's God's will for us. I spent, I've wasted the majority of my Christian life not understanding that. I tell these young boys all the time, man, we, we get them getting on our Zoom, 18, 19 years old, and I'm like, boys, keep going. Keep trucking down the road you're going, man. I've paid for sin. I've paid for it. I've paid dearly for it. I'm just trying to save young people some heartache. I, there's not one sin in my past where I look back and say, well, that was fruitful. What fruit had you in those things whereof you are now ashamed? I sit and I think about things I've done. I sit and about, think about things I still do, thoughts that I still have, and I'm ashamed. But I'm not ashamed of God's Son. Not ashamed of Him. Our sanctification, we talked about this, guys, and I, I'm going to close here. And next, next Wednesday or next Sunday, man, we're going to look at some of Paul's commandments. I mean, just let me, let me fast forward here real quick and show you this here at the end. I want you to look at this. That's just in the book of Ephesians from chapter 4 to chapter 5. Halfway through chapter 4. Speak truth. Do you know Paul said your motive for laboring, the new man's motive 
He said, let him that stole steal no more, but let him rather labor with his hands that he may have to give to him that needeth. Paul's not just saying go to work and labor. He's saying the, mo the heart's motive of labor should be for giving, not for hoarding. <laughs> Amen. The new man's motive in laboring is to give. Minister grace to the hearers. Grieve not. Just look at the commandments just from Ephesians 4, 25 onward. Then you come into Philippians. They keep going through Philippians. That your love may abound yet more and more knowledge and in all judgment. That you may approve the things that are excellent in nothing terrified of your adversaries. Do all things without murmuring and complaining. That's the stuff I skipped over as a young Christian. I thought the strong meat of God's word were the four dimensions of the universe. And oh boy, we're going to rip open a T-bone tonight, you know. That's the strong meat right there. By using that meat right there is how God exercises your senses to discern good and evil. Amen. He gives you judgment of what's good and what's right, what's true, what's holy. Look right here. I used to not understand this passage. I'm going to put my notes up. I used to not understand this passage. What, what do you not want me ignorant of, Paul? Because what are we talking about? We're talking about how we are to walk and to please God. There's this mentality today that every Christian, because he has the same standing in Christ, that every Christian is equally pleasing to God in their state. Right? The man out here, a, a Christian goes to the strip club and sits there and gets drunk and watches half-naked women roll around is just as pleasing to God as the man out here walking the way he's supposed to walk. What a vile mindset. And it's not Pauline in the least. Because Paul said right here to the Corinthian church that he didn't want them ignorant of something. What didn't he want them ignorant of? See that word all? All our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized under Moses in the cloud. You getting it? They all went under the cloud, they all passed through the sea and they were all baptized under Moses in the cloud and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. All, you got it? They were all brought out of Egypt. They were all, the Passover was for that whole nation. The, all the firstborn of Israel was redeemed. God brought them all out of Egypt. They all had the same baptism. They all had the same provision of meat and drink. You got it? But, but with many of them, God was not what? You say, you say what was Israel's problem? Israel's problem is they never took the why serious. They were the beneficiaries of all of it. God tells them at the end of it there in Exodus 19, he says, you've seen, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you where? Unto myself. You've seen it, Israel. No other people have I ever done that for. You are a special people unto me. I redeemed you. I baptized you. I provided for you. I have fought for you. I have, I have, I have, I have killed 
for you. You're mine. Now, therefore, if you will obey, you will be my holy nation. You get in the picture? All it's none of it matters. None of the positional stuff matters if you don't know why. And if you don't take it serious, that includes me and all of us. Blood was shed for me. Just like, just like Israel had the Passover. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. And then there was blood shed. A price was paid for Paul Lucas's soul. And then he took me and baptized me into the death of his son that I may walk in newness of life. That's why God doesn't want you continuing dead in sin and trespasses. Continuing to walk according to the course of this world. He baptized me in the death that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth I should not serve sin. That was the greatest truth that I learned in my life is that I'm freed from sin. I never felt like it. And then I started believing. Reckon yourself dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto who? Alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. My freedom from sin is through his death. My life unto God is through his life. And so just like Israel, when they went down into the Red Sea, Pharaoh, the old, the old taskmaster, the one that made them serve in hard bondage, is now trying to bring that redeemed people back into bondage to himself. And God sends them through the Red Sea, and he drowns and kills Pharaoh there, and Israel comes out on the other side with a new mediator. Moses, the one who's going to give him the law. You and I were baptized into death. There was, the, there was the old taskmaster, the old man, the old servant, the, the, old, the old master of sin, and we were his servants. And God, through the death of Christ, destroyed that old man. And now we've been baptized that we might live unto God through the life of God's Son. God has given us the provision just like he gave Israel the meat and the drink. God has given us the provision. Our provision is not just death. Our provision is union to the one risen from the dead and his spiritual life functioning in us. So what does Paul tell us to do in light of that? How did Israel respond to their sanctification? They continued to lust after evil things. They were idolaters, fornicators. They tempted Christ. They murmured against God. Amen? You know, if you go back and read the story there in the book of Numbers, when they're running around with the daughters of Moab, 23,000 of them have died in one day. And the next day, they're continuing. What is wrong with these people? And one of the, what's his name, Corn? Phineas. Phineas. One of, one of them there sees, sees one of the children of Israel walking through the camp with a Moabite woman. And he picks up a javelin and just thrusts him through. And God stops the plague. God said, there's what I'm looking for. Zealousy. Fear. I can work with that. Do you know that man's sons, that family, gets a special place in the sanctuary of God, in the kingdom because of that? Amen. That's a man that was zealous for what was holy. The camp of God is holy. What are you doing? You are a holy people going to a holy land to be a holy nation with a holy God. But they lusted and 
fornicated and committed idolatry. And because of that, they were overthrown in the wilderness. You see that? These things were our what? For what intent? Oh, that's a tough one, ain't it? Isn't that a tough one? Y'all got flesh? Y'all got a body? I got a body. Well, you, you, don't, you don't think my flesh lusts after evil things? But there's my warning. Right? Now all these things happened unto them for examples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore what? Let him that thinketh he what? What am, I, what am I talking about there? I have fallen in my Christian life. I've seen many saints fall. Because this stuff is not expounded. This stuff is not taught. Paul ain't talking about falling from your salvation or anything. He's talking about falling into temptation and being overcome. And when that happens, just like them Jews died in the wilderness, having never come into fullness of what God had called them to, you can fall to temptation and never come into the fullness of what God has separated us for in Jesus Christ. Corinthians and Galatians is your wilderness. Ephesians is where the book of Numbers picks up. The faithful in Christ and he starts getting you dressed and saying, now put your armor on, boys. We're getting ready to go to war in the heavenly realm. We've left the children in the wilderness. We've left, that. We've left many, of, many of them in the wilderness. Guys, we're going on to something. In my, a vast majority of my Christian life, man, I'm going to be honest with you guys. And I'm still dealing with it. I still battle these things. I'm just trying to be honest with you guys, man. I'm a man. I'm still, I still deal with things on a daily basis. But I, I dealt with things in my late 20s. My son knows about them. He knows what's going on in my home and in my life. Guys, I'm going to tell you right now. Every time I've set my heart to serve God, Satan has come at me hard since I was in my early 20s. It attacks my family. It just, it comes hard, man. What am I supposed to do? I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. In my late 20s, man, things happened in my family and in my home. And I got bitter. And before you know it, three, four years went by and I hadn't even been in church. My tongue was vile and wicked. Working in the coal mines saying things I ought not to say. And I don't care to tell you all this stuff. But I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you right now, man. Take heed. Lest any root of bitterness springing up whereby many be defiled. It'll get you. Every one of you that thinks you stand better take heed lest you fall. Brethren, if you see a man overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. If you've lost sight of the fact that your fallen brother could be you, it is going to be you. Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Amen. Uh, Brother Gary, you close us out. Yeah. Oh, I, we all do, Gary. No place for pride in all, any of us. The law of faith is why we are the way we are. And Paul said we can't boast because it's not a law of works, it's a law of faith. The good that I am is Christ in me, Gary, and the 
The bad that I am is where I've not yet attained to. That's just the reality of it. And it, it, we got to be forbearing with one another and long-suffering and patient, but we also got to be striving together for the same thing.